Welcome aboard the HMAS Evans. This is the Oberon class, Cold War era Aussie submarine which sank the USS Enterprise, delivered special forces to Southeast Asia, and stalked the Soviet Navy throughout the world's oceans. None of these missions could have been achieved if not for her unprecedented stealth. So how do you hide one of Australia's most important weapons? Obviously, the ovens is pretty easy to spot when on the surface, but that's not where we tend to operate. By going just 10 meters down, the ship's black painted hull, combined with reasonably tropping conditions, makes spotting them pretty much impossible. Because of this, we don't rely on visible light in order to detect submarines, but instead use some specialized technology. Give me a ping, Vasily. One ping only, please. This iconic sound, the ping, not Sean Connery, is part of what's known as a submarine's active sonar system. In just the same way as a batch uses echolocation, active sonar works by generating an intense pulse of sound, which then bounces off any nearby objects and returns to the vessel. We record the return signal using an array of underwater microphones, or hydrophones, embedded into key positions in the hull. All of that incoming data is routed here into the sonar room, where it is analyzed by computers and trained technicians. By comparing the order in which our hydrophones are activated, we can work out where our sound is coming from. We calculate how far away our object is by multiplying the known speed of sound by the time between emitting the ping and hearing its echo, remembering to divide by two to account for the return path. By using a little bit of basic trig, we can account for more complicated pathways that our sound might be taking, giving us a detailed model of our surrounds. Active sonar is great for spotting enemy warships, but they can just as easily generate their own pings and search for us as well. Therefore, we want to be sure that our submarine either doesn't reflect any of these signals, or else disguises its reflection to look like something more innocent. Anechoic tiles are attached to all external surfaces. They are basically thick rubber sheets with an array of precisely sized holes drilled into them. These holes are designed to trap incoming sound or modify the reflected signature. These are the equivalent to the foam sound studio towers which you may be familiar with, and are roughly as good at stopping an echo. Unfortunately, you can't see any of them today on the oven submarine because they are one of the first things that get removed. They are very sensitive military hardware. As a kid, I remember playing Marco Polo in the pool. If yelling Marco and waiting for the returning Polo is active sonar, then listening as your friends run across the deck and jump in with a splash is the equivalent of passive sonar. Since listening is a much more reliable way of spotting enemy vessels, staying quiet has become an essential element of submarine warfare. One of the loudest parts of a submarine is its screw, what we might also refer to as a propeller. In order to illustrate why it's so loud, I've commandeered a friend's boat and lashed it to the side of a jetty. I'm now turning on the motor. Let's see what happens. Looking very closely, you can see a thin triple helix of bubbles being formed, corkscrewing off each of the propeller blades. These aren't bubbles of air, but instead steam. The water around the blades is boiling. It's a well-known fact that water boils at precisely 100 degrees Celsius, except that isn't entirely true. To demonstrate, I filled up this bottle with water and connected it to a vacuum pump. Turning it on, we're taking out all of the air from the top of our flask, producing a vacuum. After just a couple more seconds, yep, there we go, it's starting to bubble. This is boiling water. It's not boiling because of temperature. I can touch with my hand. Instead, it's boiling because of pressure. Something really interesting has to be going on. You can think of it like being at a concert, where the audience is our water molecules and security is the ambient pressure. If we increase the energy of our audience members, analogous to increasing the water temperature, then they can break through the security line. If, on the other hand, we reduce the number of security, equivalent to reducing the ambient pressure, then the audience members can again break through this line. In both cases, we say that the water has boiled, and our concert goers are having a rocket time. <laughs> if we use a more volatile liquid, like acetone, then it's able to boil much more readily. This would be the equivalent of having your audience comprised of Navy SEALs. When a submarine screw spins quickly, it forms a low pressure region behind the blade. As we saw earlier, it's this low pressure which causes the water to boil 
and turn into water vapor, even though no temperature change is taking place. This is what's known as cavitation. After the bubbles move away from the low pressure region around the propeller, the external water pressure crushes them back down and they implode. As the bubbles collapse, an intense pocket of thousands of degrees centigrade and hundreds of atmospheres of pressure is formed. With millions of these mini shockwaves happening every second, they make for a very loud, very characteristic noise signature. These don't just alert enemy vessels of your presence, but also slowly eat away at the edges of the blades. There are a few different ways of reducing noise. We could reduce the shaft speed, which does result in loss of cavitation, but at the same time massively reduces thrust. On the other hand, there are some very smart military engineers who have designed the perfect propeller. As to what it might look like, well, we really have no idea because they're not telling. However, based on the satellite photograph, they can assume that they have large flat surfaces in order to minimize cavitation while still having pretty good thrust. Back inside, our aim is to keep the machinery as quiet as possible, starting here in the engine room. These massive diesels burn through a lot of oxygen. If we were to turn them on when underwater, we'd asphyxiate the crew pretty much immediately. On top of that, they're also pretty loud, meaning that if we were to turn them on, we'd alert the entire Soviet Navy of our precise location. For these reasons, we only ever turn them on when we are near the surface and in relatively safe waters. These generators charge two enormous lead-acid batteries, which can later be used to power the submarine for three days. For context, these could run an Aussie home for two years, or drive a Tesla around the world three and a half times. When we want to move the sub, we need to be sure that the gears connecting the electric motor to the drive shaft mesh exactly. If they don't, then we'll get lots of unwanted noisy vibration. Nowadays, a computer will design and cut the gears, getting micrometer precision. However, back where the ovens was built, they'd have been made by hand. While we're on the topic of submarine propulsion, and given my love for the movie The Hunt for Red October, it would be silly of me not to mention the silent Caterpillar Drive, which features so heavily in that film. Also known as a magnetohydrodynamic drive, this is actually a real-life technology, and I've managed to build my own small-scale working model using some materials I found in my garage. We could test out in the pool. It is a salt pool, so in theory it should work. However, to get the full impression, I filled up my bathtub with a few bucket loads worth of salt to get just the right conditions. As you can see, the boat is traveling through the water without any moving parts. Although it may appear to be a perpetual motion machine, trust me, it isn't one. If it were, then I would have already commercialized it and made millions of dollars. So instead, I'm going to tell you how it works. Here is the view from under the surface. You can see lots of tiny bubbles being formed, but these aren't what's propelling it through the water. If you're interested in those bubbles, then I've discussed hydrolysis within my Martian Caves video. For the boat, we have a battery wired into two metal plates and some very strong neodymium magnets superglued to the bottom. The whole thing is supported by some foam floats. My salt-laden bath water contains lots of positive sodium and negative chlorine ions. The sodium are attracted towards the negative plate and the chlorine towards the positive one. By itself, that is not enough to move the boat. But remember that we also have a bunch of really strong magnets glued to the underside. These are all aligned so that the south pole is pointing towards the water, giving us an upward magnetic field. When a moving charge passes through a magnetic field, a force is exerted on that charge. For the positive, we use the right-hand rule to remember which direction that force is in. Thumb in the direction the charge is moving, index finger in the direction of the field, and finally, force on the particle is given by the direction of your middle finger. Therefore, our positive sodium ions are being forced backward and thus pushing the ship forward through the water. Now, when I first started looking at this technology, I thought that obviously the negative chlorine ions would be pushed out the front and the boat wouldn't move at all, but that is not what we observed. What I was forgetting is that negative charges don't use the right-hand rule, but instead the left-hand rule. Since the chlorine ions are moving towards the port or left side of the ship, but the field is still pointing upward, using the left-hand rule, we find that our negative charges are also being pushed out the back making the ship move forward. The reason that this won't work in freshwater is that there just simply aren't enough ions to be moving around. Unfortunately, even a scaled up version of the drive wouldn't be all that good. The current passing through the water produces bubbles as well as noise, while the strong magnetic field would be easily detectable. On top of that, the thrust isn't even all that great either, which means that it would barely work to move a submarine. You saw how bad it was at moving the boat across my bathtub. 
In space travel, where none of these issues matter, this becomes the foundation of iron propulsion. But before we use it to explore the outer reaches of the universe, back on the HMAS ovens, we've spotted the Soviet Navy. And I think we're going into battle. When stalking an enemy ship, or indeed being hunted by one, sailors were told to cease all unnecessary activity and remain silent, perhaps lying down in their bunks. While there is some discussion as to how effective this could be, as compared with the noises of the ship itself, it is undeniably an excellent way of instilling a sense of caution. More than one war game has been lost by the unfortunate clang of a toilet seat or by someone tripping down the stairs. Even the most regimented crew on a perfectly designed submarine can't be completely silent, but there are other ways of preventing that noise from reaching the enemy. When not being used to load torpedoes, this hatch would have been sealed shut, supported by some thick steel plates. It was common practice to slip up a penny between these plates so that after a dive it could be extracted as a thin wafer. When decimal currency came in in 1996, there was a shortage in these copper pennies, so instead 5 and 10 cent pieces were used. These nickel coins are much harder than copper, harder even than the steel pads, and you can still see the indent that they've left. I can think of no better demonstration as to the extreme lows experienced during a deep sea dive. Officially, the ovens has a maximum diving depth of 300 meters, although it's probably designed to go even deeper. It achieves this by using a 25 millimeter thick pressure hull. This doesn't just allow the submarine to survive high pressure dives, but its large mass also prevents vibration from passing from inside the sub into the surrounding water. Counterintuitively, the bigger that submarines are, the quieter they become, since they can dedicate more volume to thicker and therefore more sound insulating pressure hulls. If you can't afford super thick steel, then you can use a bit of clever marine science to help hide your noise. Sound travels faster in warm water than cool, and is also faster the more saline that water is. Temperature decreases with depth, while salinity increases with depth, which gives us a triangular shaped speed profile. If we put our submarine at the vertex of this speed triangle, then the sound that travels upwards will be bent back down, and the sound going down will be bent back up. This is similar to how a mirage works with visible light. Our narrow sound channel makes our submarine invisible to anyone not in that channel. It is the challenge of navigators and marine scientists to work out where that channel can be found. By using these techniques, the HMAS Ovens is able to remain invisible. During the Cold War, she sailed for almost 1 million kilometers, both above and below the waves. In peacetime, she competed in the Kangaroo 2 Joint Naval Operation with the United States. Among her simulated strikes, she managed to sink the USS Enterprise by taking a photograph of the aircraft carrier using her periscopes without being detected. They celebrated this victory by strapping a broom to the top of the periscope, representing them sweeping the simulated enemy from the seas. Nowadays, that sort of achievement would be recognized by blaring men at work's land down under as loud as possible. Heard one. I thought I heard singing, sir. With a land girt by sea, submarines have become an essential part of the Australian military. Although we've covered much of the technology used to keep them silent, ultimately much of this has to remain a military secret. While the HMAS ovens may today be decommissioned, she helped to guide the way for the next generation of Australian subs, silently guarding us beneath the waves. This has been James Dingley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up.